when I look at the political landscape and the economic landscape of the world, I really have a difficult time accepting that this is what life should be. We had so many concerns about education, technology, agriculture, Barbuda, health, the environment. You, you will be so surprised as to what they are engaged in. If we can do that, we can walk on that path, we will find a lot of solutions, we'll find a lot of adventures, we'll find a lot of answers. We need to foster that entrepreneurial spirit. No judgment, no negativity, all good vibes and conversations. All this and more, right here on Grassroots Radio. Welcome back podcast fans and hello to our new listeners. We're so pleased to have you joining us for another episode of Grassroots Radio. I'm your host, Unique Bird, and my guest today is Nasira Mohammed, the full-time media officer with the West Indies women's cricket team and who also holds the same position part-time with the men's cricket team. Nasira has worked as a sports journalist in Trinidad and Tobago before moving to Antigua and taking up her current post. In this conversation, Nasira and I discuss the differences between Antiguan and Trinidadian culture, her jet-setting travel schedule, touring the world with the West Indies cricket teams, and how she stays grounded and supported living away from her close-knit East Indian and Trinidadian family. This podcast is a project of the new grassroots and it's all about highlighting the positive side of life and youth culture right here in Antigua and Barbuda. And we're doing this through interviews with exceptional young Antiguans and Barbudans about how they see the world, the challenges they're facing, and what motivates them to keep working towards a bright future for our country, region, and the world. And with all that said, let's get into our interview with Nasira Mohammed. <laughs> well, my name is Nasira Mohammed. I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago, your southern neighbors. Um, currently living in Antigua. Almost two years. It'll be two years on the 21st of September. Um, I work at Cricket West Indies, formerly the West Indies Cricket Board. I work at the office as a communication executive. However, I also function in a dual role as a media officer full-time for the West Indies women's cricket team and part-time with the West Indies senior men's cricket team. So we're here in Antigua. Cricket season has officially started international series in their uh, coming, in their senior men's team coming. And mm-hmm. that's my job for now. Right. That sounds very interesting and very exciting. And it also sounds like you're very much still a newcomer to Antigua. So what brought you to Antigua in this role in the first place? So I had a a really good friend that is originally from Antigua. She lives here and we knew each other since 2012, I believe it was. So I've been coming to Antigua uh, from 2013 onwards, probably like three, four times for the year. Mm -hmm. And I was a sports journalist back in Trinidad. And, you know, every time I come to Antigua on vacation, I usually pick up a couple sports stories so like I don't know if you know of the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge it's a rowing challenge yes where, right so uh, one year you had Dr. Nick Fuller then the other year you had Eli Fuller and then this year we had the Antigua the Antigua, um, Antigua girls, Island girls yes correct row across so the first year that the year that Dr. Fuller and they rode across I was here and as a sports journalist, and I picked up a story on a brother and sister that rode across. They actually they didn't row across together. He rode across with a men's team. She rode across with a women's team. But they both came in first in their um, gender categories. So I did a story, and then I did a story on Renee Edwards being part of an all female, the only all female drag racing team in the Caribbean, and they're you know from here in Antigua. So I've always had a connection with Antigua regarding sports and stuff like that and then obviously my friend and then i got a job offer from cricket west indies in august of 2017 and i said this is it this is what i wanted to do you don't get an opportunity every day to work at west indies cricket resigned my job in trinidad gave up my gratuity or my benefits and moved to antigua so it's been just about two years since i've been here now 
Can you kind of give me an idea of what a typical day in your work life looks like? Because it sounds like you could be doing any number of things on a given day. Is there? That's correct. Um, so, okay. So when I'm not on tour with one of the teams, I'm in Antigua at Cricket West Indies office, which is just near the parliament. Um, it's behind the High Court and Ministry of Legal Affairs. If Antiguans or anybody listening and they're familiar with Antigua, they'll know where exactly where it is. So I'm there as a regular job, 8.30 to 4.30. Um, and dealing with public relations and communications for Cricket West Indies. So there's always something happening, whether there's an actual cricket match or not. So we have information to put out to the public, little stories that we want to get known, whether it's about a player or initiative that we're doing at Cricket West Indies or something just as a reminder on social media to say, oh, well, 20 years ago on this day, this is what happened, etc. So it's little things like that and little stories that I'm sitting at my desk and writing about players, past, present, and future. And when I'm not at Cricket West Indies office and I'm on tour with a team, I go to training with them or we have obviously cricket matches. And my role, in, my function in that role is I have to write all the match reports. So if they play a game, I have to put all the scores that goes out to the international and regional mm-hmm. Caribbean media Um, detailing win, loss, or draw. Uh, I have to do interviews with the players, um, develop content. So you might have a new player on tour or you might have a player who is junior on the team and you would want to highlight it or you might want to interview. I might do content on a senior player to say, you know, how have they managed to sustain their career over the years, etc. Because we have some of these girls playing 10 plus years on the team how do they manage to keep their bodies at that optimal level for an international athlete? Little things like that, you always develop content. Yeah, that's actually really interesting because I know in other parts of the world, if you're a professional athlete, that is your job. That's all you're doing all the time. And in the West Indies, that's not always the case. So is it that these women, in addition to being part of this international very high level athletic competition is that their full-time work or are they also holding regular jobs off season most of them are full-time cricketers but we do have a couple of girls that have jobs back where they live um afi fletcher is from grenada she works for the government in grenada uh we also have shakira salman who is actually a coach a cricket coach and she works with the Ministry of Education and Sports back in Barbados, where she's from. And, you know, she coaches at primary school level and she coaches on weekends and stuff like that. So these girls and uh, a couple of us have, you know, small jobs on the side where they, they work back at home, but their main focus is cricket. And you mentioned that sometimes you're able to travel around with them. What are some of the destinations that you've been to and kind of experiences that you've had living that you know, a little bit of the road life. It's not a little bit of the road life because it's a lot of the road life. Okay, what's the road life? Um, So, like, my friends and they laugh at me because they say, you live in Antigua, but we think Mm -hmm. you really live on a plane because I'm usually on a plane majority of the time, probably 85% of the time. Um, 85% of the time? 85% of the time, and I will tell you, I will tell you. So, I will give you an example of how my year usually is structured so last year february to march all of march i was in new zealand with the women's team came back to antigua was here for probably a month and a half and then from the end of may till the beginning of august i was with the senior men's team so we traveled the entire caribbean so we went jamaica trinidad st lucia barbados antigua jamaica Guyana, St. Kitts, Florida. Whoa. Right? And then right. came back, came back to Antigua for three weeks, then went to Barbados for one week to do some content with the women's team because they had a series there. Came mm-hmm. back to Antigua and then left with the senior men's team to go on tour to India and Bangladesh. And that was the rest of 2018. So I was in, in I was in Dubai, India and Bangladesh with West Indies men's team from September until December the 23rd. Wow, that is quite the year. 
<laughs> so island yeah. hopping, globe trotting, all of it. That's correct. That's and then fantastic. this year, back out with the women's team, we went to Dubai and Pakistan, and then Ireland and England. Wow. So you're crossing a lot of time zones, crossing a lot of different climates and things like that. How do you, I mean, stay prepared for all of that, like going from the Caribbean to Ireland to New Zealand to Dubai? <laughs> it's a lot of variation. It is a lot of variation. Um, you really have to keep your body in check at all times. The slightest variation that you would notice, you need to you know, be on top of it because you don't want to get your immune system that weak that you get sick. I mean, sickness and getting a cold is inevitable wherever you go. You will have it maybe for a day or two just to get acclimated to wherever you are. Um, but a lot of vitamin C, a lot of oranges, <laughs> Um, a lot of vitamins and the gym usually has to be a friend to keep your body, you know, in constant check to make sure that you're not lazing and stuff like that. It seems like you have a really deep passion for sports, which, you know, as a woman and you, your background, well, your background, but your faith is Muslim. I think you mentioned that in your bio. That's and correct. There can sometimes be a lot of restrictions on women in certain cultures about doing these kind of things that could be perceived as more masculine. So I guess it's kind of a two-part question. What sports in particular are you most interested in? Like, what do you play? Cricket. Cricket. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you found your dream job, essentially. <laughs> exactly that. Exactly that. Right. And then how involved are you like yourself personally and playing cricket right now? And, and how did you get your start in that sport? As I tell everybody, mm -hmm. cricket, particularly West Indies cricket, is part of our identity in the Caribbean. Totally. I, don't, I mean, I know a lot of people who actually don't really follow cricket or don't like cricket, but obviously you're somehow involved in it because you're aware that it's happening. I would Whether definitely you... be one of those people. Like... <laughs> I don't really follow cricket, but I know even growing up, like my dad, his brothers, the cousins, they're all, it was an event in the house if the West Indies was playing, right? So even if I'm not personally that interested, there is a party in the house. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and, and, and so you're it, pulled into it, yeah. It, and it still is like that. I mean, now we don't have that much frequent victorious results that we used to when all of us were growing up. But nevertheless, West Indies cricket is still an event. You still want to see that they probably have to make five runs off the last ball on the, on the, off the last over. And, you know, you just want, you just live for that excitement. Yeah. But yeah, so West Indies cricket is part of us, part of our identity. And I grew up looking at cricket with my grandmother in particular, because every holiday, every weekend, I would go to her house and stay. And my grandmother and her sisters and some of my other aunts, they were the ones that really got me involved in cricket. Funny you would think that because we're somewhat of a patriarchal society in the Caribbean that, you know, I would get this from my male relatives. Mm -hmm. Totally the opposite. It was my grandmother and my aunts that got me involved. My aunts took me to my first cricket match at the Queen's Park Oval in Trinidad. It was West Indies versus England in 1996. I distinctly remember these things. Mm -hmm. And they fostered that love and that passion for me for cricket. And like I played in primary school, I played in secondary school. I played when I was at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine. I played for two years. And then after that, you know, when you leave school and you have to juggle a career and then you have to get time for training and stuff, it was a little bit difficult considering the fact that my job was as, as a sports journalist mm -hmm. and, and I used to work for television. So when you have to write for the 7 p.m. news and you go out on assignment, I, you know, couldn't juggle training times which would be the same time as when I have to write my stories and my reports for the 7 p.m. news. So it was a little bit of a difficult decision for me to give up cricket at that time, mm -hmm. but I was still involved in it. Like I used to make sure that I get the calendar and know that when they have cricket games and I would cover it, you know, from a news report kind of aspect. Mm -hmm. And now for me, I consider it to be a privilege to be able to work for West Indies cricket because it's something that I grew up on, it's something that I cherish, and something that I want to see grow and become better than it already is. 
that is so inspirational that you've been this has been such a big part of your life for so long and now you're in the position where you're able to contribute very directly to it and to growing that same love and spreading it you know with other people and it's also really beautiful that it was the women in your family who encouraged you to do this maybe not so traditional thing i'm of east indian descent no Obviously, East Indians came to Caribbean as indentured laborers to work on sugarcane plantations. So that's how, that's my history um, in being from Trinidad. Yeah. And so probably six or seven, maybe eight generations go back of my family have all been born and bred in Trinidad and Tobago. So for me, Caribbean culture, Caribbean lifestyle, West Indies culture, West Indies lifestyle is what I have known my entire life. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I wear the hijab because I'm Muslim, but the hijab is part of me just as West Indies cricket is part of me, just as sport is a, is a, is a part of me. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things I always say that I'm blessed to be born in this part of the world and this culture because my family is not conservative. They're not restrictive on me in anything that I choose to do. And, you know, when I was making this decision to move to Antigua, I had a lot of relatives that came up to me and be like, are you sure, you know, this is, this is, this is the right decision for you and you're going to have to live by yourself? And I'm like, but don't your kids go off to university and live by themselves for four years mm-hmm. and some of them never return and, you know, they make a life for themselves over there. So it's the same thing for me now. And it wasn't even the fact that I'm, a woman or a Muslim or anything like that. It was just the fact that, I guess, fear of the unknown. Right. And my parents have always been supportive and encouraging of me in any decision that I've made. And my dad was like, you know, just be careful, be safe, and enjoy what it is you do. And my mother has the same, the same idea. My mother, my mother's biggest worry was not the fact that I was leaving home to move to another country, was the fact that if I can survive and cook for myself. <laughs> A lot of moms have that concern. <laughs> Mine definitely shares that she constantly still. I've lived outside of Antigua for almost 10 years now. And I still, every time I talk to my mom, it's like, are you cooking? What are you doing? <laughs> are you eating? It's like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> I, 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 I will <laughs> tell you this though. Every time my mother gets a chance, she'd be like, do you have any friends that are coming up from Trinidad or they're coming down from Antigua to Trinidad and coming back up? She'll send food for me. And I'm like, you know, I can do all this stuff. (laughs) She sent you what kind of food? Like cooked food? Yeah, like cooked food. She will send roti or she will send um, like Trinidadian beef soup, which she knows I like. Mm. Or she would send um, lentils, which that's probably one thing that I can't make. Stewed lentils. Well, at least it doesn't come out how my mother's own comes out. Mm -hmm. So she sends me stewed lentils and doubles, of course. Oh my gosh, you're making me hungry. <laughs> uh, okay, so now that we're on to food, <laughs> what are like some of the differences, like moving from Trinidad to Antigua? I don't think that's a very popular move that not too many. <laughs> uh, I think maybe more people go the other way. So what are some of the differences culture-wise? I can think of one um, I'd be interested in hearing, like, I know that Trinidad has much more of a mix of different cultures, like Correct. Indian descent. We don't really have too much of that in Antigua. So what are some of those little differences that may have created a bit of a culture shock for you in moving to a smaller island? Um, it's the fact, okay, you mentioned it, that there isn't a big in East Indian population in Antigua. Mm-hmm. There are a few Indians, um, so most of them are like India Indians who obviously attend the medical university here in Antigua right. um, at AUA. A few of them have businesses and stuff, and then a lot of them are mostly Guyanese that migrate to Antigua, obviously for a better life, etc. But my biggest culture shock is, and I guess maybe it's because I come from Trinidad and we're all open and know about each other's culture and Mm -hmm. customs and you learn a lot about different people um and then coming Mm -hmm. here you live amongst them (laughs) correct correct and then when i first started to come here and i mean it happens now but very 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 rarely 
would you see somebody and they're like totally lost and look at you and be like, why you look that way? Mm. And you see it a lot in kids' faces, especially mm-hmm. because like back home, you would have, I guess, religious education or you would have primary schools where you have other Muslims, girls that wear the hijab as well. And obviously their friends are assimilated and they know, okay, well, this is why the person is wearing this and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But then when you come here and you see kids, little kids staring at you and it, you, you know it's because they're not educated as to, okay, yeah. there are other religions and other cultures existing other than what we know. Mm-hmm. So that's probably the biggest thing for me. Yeah. I mean, I think I've been guilty of doing that myself as an adult because I went back to Antigua I don't know, maybe two years ago. And I saw people with the hijab. Mm -hmm. And I'm used to seeing that in Canada. It's not a surprising thing to me, but I'm not used to seeing it in Antigua. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, there are quite a few of them now. Okay, yeah. And it was just it was just that moment of okay, all right, cool. Um, but have you like faced any anything other than kind of a strange look? No, I, I just this one guy one time in the bank came up to me and obviously he vocalized it. What everybody's face is mm-hmm. usually say so he actually vocalized it. And then the the one of the bank managers who you know is a good friend of mine, he was like, "Dude, we live in a country where everybody has freedom of rights, freedom of expressions, freedom of religion. This is her religion. This is her expression. So yeah, I don't like, think you should question why she's wearing it." Yeah, just relax. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I will tell you though, the biggest joke is everybody thinks that I go that I attend AUA, which is American University of Antigua. Okay. So everybody automatically assumes that I'm a student there. Hmm. So once I work at your advantage sometimes? Um, not all the time because usually they ask to see my student ID and I'm like, exactly. I don't work at AUA. Oh man, the assumptions we make. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hilarious. And, and like last week I came back from Trinidad because I went to do a tournament in Trinidad and I came back and the taxi driver was like, um, but I thought the semester wasn't starting until two weeks later. I'm like, oh my goodness. no, I'm not, I'm not I'm going not. to the university. I need, I need to get to my workplace. <laughs> so is there anything else about living in Antigua that's been an adjustment? Um, there are no malls. No malls, yeah. Right, shopping centers. No, I'm not. I'm not a mall, I'm not a mall rat, right? Mm-hmm. But I think because I grew up with the luxuries and convenience of having stuff so readily available in Trinidad, in Antigua it's a bit different in terms of you know if you have to get stuff you probably have to buy it online and wait a week or two before you get it. Mm-hmm. As opposed to Trinidad, you can go to a store, go to a shopping center and you readily get it. But because I've been coming to Antigua years before I actually move here permanently, it doesn't bother me. But I have to explain that constantly to my friends who would come to visit or my relatives that would come to visit and they'd be like, oh, so can we go to the shopping center? I'm like, well, and if you want to go to Heritage Key, but, you know, or oh, Woods there, Mall, basically. Yeah. Or be, but, um, like, I mean, compared to shopping center, so you would know Square One or Eaton Center or something mm-hmm. like that. So we have something, not as big as that, but we have similar types stores yeah. in Trinidad. I've been to Trinidad, yeah. Right. So And that's one of the attractions because we go down there and we're like, we're taking the opportunity to shop because <laughs> correct. you have correct. more options there than you would in Antigua. Right. So, but, but for me, I love Antigua and I think I love it because of the fact that I'm constantly moving about so I'm on tour internationally and regionally so that when I'm actually back in Antigua like I like the downtime I like the quiet I can I live seven minutes from the beach that I can go to the beach in the evening time and just sit down and relax for an hour what beach um, Dickinson Bay oh great one of my favorites yeah so I can just go there and, you know, unwind after a day or whatever it is or sit in my balcony and see Dickinson Bay and just relax. And, you know, for me, that's what attracted me to Antigua because when I was moving here, a lot of my friends were like, well, what is there to do in Antigua beside the beach? And I'm like, well, there are other things that you can do. And when you know people, obviously, you 
you have little house lines etc mm-hmm. um but for me i love the serenity of it how often do you get visits from trinidad like people come here to yeah visit like people me? coming in and um the, that's the thing like my relatives come probably twice a year Okay. That's, yeah, about twice yeah. or three times a year. But I try to go home like every four months, every five months, um, okay. to see my relatives. That's lovely. So you have a like a close knit family. It sounds like. Yeah, I have one younger brother. He's four years younger than I am, and then my parents and my grandmother. But I come from a large extended family. Like the street mm-hmm. that I live on, it's ninety eight percent of my relatives. Wow. So yeah. So when I go home, I'm usually not at home. I go home to sleep in the night, but then during the day, I'm visiting everybody. And mm-hmm. on a Friday night, particularly, um, like I go next door by one of my aunts. It's been a tradition in our family that every Friday we go to that particular house, and we sit together and we talk whatever mm-hmm. happened for the week. We eat <laughs> together, and we go there from probably about eight o'clock in the night, and sometimes we stay there until like one, two a.m. Oh wow, that's a yeah long line. Yeah. <laughs> But it's good. And particularly like if when I don't be home, so it's even better to, to just, you know, get that family time in mm-hmm. when I go home. Not that incredible that you're you're on the street and it's ninety eight percent your family. So like you're almost your own little community onto itself. Exactly. And and it's a private road. So sometimes oh, wow. we just sit on the road itself mm-hmm. and we just hang out like my cousins and they if we're all home at the same time because some of them live abroad now and other, in other parts of Trinidad so like if they know I'm coming home and the ones who are in Trinidad they'll come and you know we'll meet up and sometimes we'll probably cook outside on the road or something wow. like that yeah yeah that's great I'd like to come along with your family actually so. you're most welcome anytime <laughs> you have a very busy kind of lifestyle what are you doing to help maintain that and it sounds like we may have touched a little bit on it like seeing your friends and your family and having that that really tight connection with them seems to be really important to you and Mm -hmm. we touched on you know kind of exercising and making sure that your body is healthy for all these crazy travel transitions that you're going through but apart from that what are some of the places that you turn to for inspiration or motivation that perhaps someone who is, you know, a little bit younger and trying to find their path could take some inspiration from themselves? First off, always put God first in your life because nothing happens without, without him. It doesn't matter what religion you belong to. Everybody has a God. Um, or you have something that you focus your attentions on because we also have atheists in this world and we have to respect Mm -hmm. their choices but there is always something that you focus on and whatever it is that you focus on always know that there is a bigger power than you um whether you believe it's the universe whether you believe it's karma whether you believe it's jesus allah buddha whoever it is focus your energies on that and know that you know you are sustained you are supported by something out there um your family has to be second because without the support of your family, because even though my family live back in Trinidad, I can call on them any day at any time and be like, you know, you know, I'm a little bit stressed about something. I need to talk about something and have a group of people that are your people. Mm-hmm. Now you can have friends who are not your people and you have, you can, you need to have people who are your people who will tell you, when you're slipping down the wrong road or who can give you an advice Mm -hmm. um, when you need it, who can shout you at 2 a.m. because they know that you're probably stressed, you're probably on the other side of the world, which I've had happen to me before because it might be 2 a.m. in India and whatever time it is back home here and, you know, my friends and they would message me or I would message them and be like, yo, I need to talk about something Mm -hmm. and I can call them and and talk to them about it because traveling and being constantly on the road tends to get to you sometimes and the gym can only take out so much frustration For that sure. you might have um so you you just need to have that core group of people and it you don't need to be the most popular person 
in your village, in your country, in your school or whatever it is. You need to have a core group of people that will be there for you regardless of what it is. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, in the Caribbean, we have to say you need people to gas you up. You need to have that core group <laughs> of people to gas you up when you need the gas in. Right. And I would just add to that too, like having that, that willingness to like open up and share. Cause sometimes we like to keep things kind of inside. Like, right. You know, I don't really want anybody to know that I'm struggling with this or yeah. that this is a problem for me, but so it takes a certain level of courage and bravery to be able to open up and to share those things and to ask for the support that you need when you need it. Correct. So, yeah. Correct. And, and find people that you're comfortable talking mm-hmm. to. We're not going to judge. Um, correct. Yeah. Correct. Because we all go through some sort of problem. Nobody's life is perfect. Nobody can say, I don't have a problem with this, so I don't have a problem with that. And particularly in this day and age that we live in with, with young people being harassed and molested and stuff like that. Like I read in the news every day that you, you would have a 10-year-old or 11-year-old, maybe a 7-year-old, 8-year-old, something like that being harassed and stuff like that. We need to let these young people, boys and girls, Mm -hmm. because it doesn't only happen with girls. It happens with boys as well. Let them know that it's okay to talk about it because nothing gets solved unless communication happens. Even as adults, nothing. And you you might have an issue at work. You might have an issue at school, but nothing good comes out of anything if, if, if it's not talked about. I would, I totally agree with that. And one of the things you said is that, you know, nothing gets solved without opening up and having that communication. So it's okay to do that. And I would go a step further and say, you know, it's necessary to do that. Correct. It is necessary because a lot of what we call mental illnesses nowadays comes from bottling things up and not dealing, not having that appropriate outlet to let Mm -hmm. some of those negative experiences kind of be aired. Definitely. Are there any like books or quotes in particular that, you know, have been really helpful for you in your life that you could share? Winston Churchill. There's one quote from Winston Churchill that I really like. Never give up, never, never give up in the face of adversity. Um, You know, just persevere. And then recently I came across one by Theodore Roosevelt and it says, It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, but because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst if he feels, at least he feels while daring greatly. This place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. When I read it, I'm like, you know, it's so true in not, it, it's not only applicable to sports, but it's applicable to real life because we all have failures in life. We all have things that we attempt and, you know, it never comes out right. Like my attempt to make roti never comes out right, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop trying to make roti. <laughs> you, you dust yourself off. You give it another shot because every day is a new opportunity. Thank you so much for that. Kind of piggybacking on that quote that you just read about errors and failures. Um, not to end on a failing note, but I think it can be inspirational for others to hear about mm-hmm you know, challenges that people who seem like they have it so put together have faced in their life and kind of where they're coming from Mm -hmm. in some of the more difficult areas of their life. What would you say was one of the, one of those errors or one of those challenges that you had to overcome to get to where you are today? I am not sure if it's a challenge, but Mm -hmm. I will tell you of an experience that I had. Um, I'm not the type of person that you want to rush to do things. You know, sometimes growing up in the Caribbean, if you have dishes to wash and your parents constantly nagging you, oh, there's dishes to wash, there's dishes to wash, I'm the kind that will leave it there until I'm ready to do it. Right, you're going to your heels. (laughs) Correct. Mm -hmm. So 
when I wrote A levels, I did not want to go to university right away. And I told my mom, I said, my dad was like, it's your choice. You decide when you want to do it. My mother, on the other hand, was like, no, you're just finished with school. You might as well go on and do it straight. I said, no, can I have a year off to just take a break from school and figure out exactly what it is I wanted to do? Obviously, my mother won because she's my mother. Mm. So I went to university and I completed two years of university and I had one year remaining. And I said, that's it. I'm not going back because I got a summer job and I said, I'm not going back. That's it. And I stayed away from university for seven years. Seven, seven years. years. I mean, seven years. You took a seven year gap. Correct. And what, and were, you would... studying the, what were you studying? What we studying? Communications. You... Okay. And then the seven year gap. <laughs> seven year gap. Right. All right. And then were, were I. Were you working in communications that whole time? Nope. Not okay. at all. Mm. And I was actually working at the intellectual property office in Trinidad. I worked there for two years as a trademark officer. So like now I'm fluent in trademarks. I can tell you <laughs> legal stuff about trademarks. Okay. Um, and then when I left there, I started my own business of trademark registration and stuff. So like friends and other people that I knew that wanted advice instead of them playing a, 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 a law firm exorbitant amount of money they would pay it for me i would give them the advice do all the application the running around and stuff like that but that's beside the point and i wouldn't say it was a challenge for me but it was always in the back of my mind that i didn't finish this i didn't finish this and i'm not the type of person to start something and not finish it mm -hmm. so i went back in 2013 and they were like all right so you need to do this and you have to do over some credits etc because credits have shelf life Right. And so I did over the courses and I graduated in 2015. And for me, that was my biggest <laughs> to know that this was off my shoulders. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't really say that I've had challenges, particularly in my job area, but because of the fact that, okay, so like when I went to India last year, um, everybody saw me and I was the only female with the Western East men's team. Mm -hmm. I was the media officer. And obviously looking at, at as um, of East Indian descent, everybody automatically thought that I was from India. So they started to speak Hindi. I know some Hindi because my older relatives speak it, right? So I could understand a little bit of what it was seen, but I had to stop them. And I'm like, okay, I don't understand when you're talking mm -hmm. that fast and everything that you're seeing. And I mean not being stereotypical but it's just the reality how it is but india is really a patriarchal society mm -hmm. so it was a bit daunting not for me but for them having to deal with me to get to our team uh, uh -huh. so you would see their reactions on, on on their faces when i walk in like when we have a press conference or if i tell them that we have a media day that they can come to interview to our players and stuff like that they would show up and then they'd be like, oh, so can I talk to the media manager of the team? And I'm like, mm -hmm, that's me. And they'd be like, no, we need to talk to the media manager. I'm like, it's me. That's me. <laughs> and then I'm, 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 I'm a stickler for certain things. So when I go to a press conference, the first announcement that I make is my player's name, whoever is your representative from our team. And the second thing I do is I tell them all cell phones need to be silenced, mm -hmm. either off or on, or on airplane mode because it's disrespectful to my player for your phone to be making noise. And if it is, the press conference will stop until you deal with your situation. Mm -hmm. And I think like a lot of them, like from feedback that I got from other journalists while I was in India and even in Bangladesh, were a lot of them were Im intimidated by me because they were like, they never had a woman come in and tell them <laughs> that they have restrictions. Mm -hmm. Well, you can get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's not really challenges, but it's little speed bumps, I would call them. Right, that's a, um, good, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, little speed bumps, but, you know, I just overhaul everything. Nasira, it has been a pleasure talking to you. I'm so glad we got to connect this way. And Likewise. Yeah, you are fantastic. <laughs> Anytime you're in Antigua, shout me. Yeah, definitely we'll do that. And I hope you're in Antigua when I am. <laughs> no, I hope so too. <laughs>
If you have an idea for someone you want to see featured on this show or topics that you'd like us to cover, you can hit us up at thenewgrassroots at gmail.com and we are always so psyched to hear from you guys. So please, please go ahead, email us, let us know what you like, what you don't like, what you'd like to see in the future. We want to hear all of it. If you are curious about the new grassroots and what else we are up to, you can find us on social media. We are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook. If you search for the new grassroots, you will certainly be able to find us and get engaged that way. Go ahead and do all that great stuff too. Lastly, but certainly not leastly, I gotta give a big shout out and special thanks to Grace Ann James for co-producing this podcast and also to Fenella Francis, co-founder of The New Grassroots and Zoe Teague for their help making the show happen and you know lining guests up for us. Really appreciate all the work that you guys have put into this and of course really appreciate you, the listeners, the audience because Without you, there would be no point in doing this. So thanks so much. Much love, peace, and later.